Well, the, the didactic impulse is very strong in, in, in adult human beings. You know, a, children's literature in the 19th century was all about, don't do this, don't do that. Children who play with matches will inevitably end up in a horrible conflagration. And I, as a child, sometimes I read those, and I thought that they were just really funny because it was so very clear to me that somebody was telling me what to do, and, you know, it, I, I could figure out on my own whether or not I was going to play with matches, but just because Susie Q got burned up in a huge fire because she played with matches didn't necessarily mean that I was going to, because I, of course, was special, unlike Susie Q, who was <laughs> stupid. And you have to, you, children are like that. When they're told not to do something, sometimes it gives them an idea. But it's also true that children are sucking in values in ways we don't even know. The problem is, again, we're trying to control it. You can't always control what a child hears and what a child perceives. And, you know, every book they read is that, that, that sinks in is going to have some kind of an effect. So it is a kind of an awkward place to be where you don't really know what's landing and where it's landing and how it's landing. So you want to give them only the good. I mean, Plato wrote about this, and you know he was so obsessed with the <coughs> virtue. You could only have human beings surrounded by virtue. And you read him, and he's like a fascist. And yet, I think that we do sort of have that instinct and that impulse to only expose them to the good so that the good will be only part of them. But you cannot control the vertical and the horizontal. And sometimes the wildness does come in in the myth. You know, you can clean them up. In every generation, there'll be a different retelling of the Greek myths that stresses a different set of values, which are the values of the generation that have done the retelling. But that stuff is still there, that wild and dirty and crazy and hostile and aggressive stuff you know, is at the heart of humanity. I'm sorry, Philip. And it's not necessarily, you know, if you need to be protectionist about it, think of it as a vaccine. You just give the kids a little harmless, you know, violence or incest or whatever in your Greek myths, and they'll just read about it in a book. It won't really hurt them, but they'll sort of, you know, have the concept, and maybe then they'll, you know, be better and stronger for when they're older. And or maybe they'll just read this really good story about all this terrible stuff happening and this guy who kills his father without knowing it marries his mother and oh my god, that's so cool. You know, could be that too. I, I, life is not easy and there are wild and bad things in life and I think it's wrong to lie to children. I think it's really wrong to tell them that if you're just good enough that everything is going to come out all right because history kind of indicates that this is not necessarily the case. And if you, if you give them to Rosie a vision, then there's, they're, they're, they're left without any inoculation. They're left without any recourse. And a lot of what fairy tale is about is something really bad happens, now what do you do? You lose your family, now what do you do? You're, you're, you're violated, you're, you're taken away from your, 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 you're threatened with death. If you don't do this impossible task, now what do you do? And in every case, whether it's a girl or a boy, a man or a woman who is the hero of a fairy tale, they cope. And giving coping mechanisms to children and to show that no matter, yes, my life isn't that bad, my experience isn't that extreme, but I can cope too, is really, I think, very valuable. Oh, are you kidding? With a kid, it is that bad. With a kid, you know, not being allowed to go out and play because you didn't clean your room is as bad as Cinderella where she never has any fun and she always has a miserable time and people are always mean to her. You know, you're always in that present moment when you're a kid. But I totally agree. And I, I Terry Winling, who's done an enormous amount with fairy tales and kids, really talks about how in her own childhood, uh, she really had a, a brutal childhood with a lot of domestic abuse and having read the fairy tales and knowing that a person in a bad situation can get through to the other side, she says it's like all that saved her. For her, Leave It to Beaver was escapist. Yeah. <laughs> and, to, and for her, The Armless Maiden was realism. And, and I think that there are a lot of children for whom that is true. It's, it's those, those rosier visions, those, those flatter visions with the, the, they don't have the mythic depth. I mean, it doesn't mean that we, we've got to be solemn all the time or even to be talking about horrors all the time. I think that play is extremely important and that one of the, the things that fantasy can give us is a sense of playfulness. Let's play with this. Let's see what happens if this is true. Let's see what happens if you can do that. And I think that, that, that Harry Potter is extremely playful. She's got a very playful imagination. 
and all of the things that she's made up that are the cool bits where the, all of the staircases move whenever you change classes, which is, of course, the way it feels when you're in a new <laughs> school. Um, but it's cool. It's very playful. And, and that, too, is, I think, something that, um, that, that myth and fairy tale can, can help bring to the modern discourse that, that isn't always there.